Uh, thanks very much, Ray, for those uh, generous remarks. Um, the first time I came to Vanderbilt in uh, 1988, it was about this time of year, and during the course of the afternoon, it started to snow, and it snowed several inches, and by the next morning, there was no cabs to take me to the airport. So, <laughs> this time, I brought tornadoes. <laughs> Um, what I want to do today is to start with um, some brief history about uh, protein phosphorylation, particularly for the, uh, the students in the audience, and then go on and tell you three short stories about current work going on in the lab, uh, time permitting. So you all know, of course, that phosphorylation is a reversible protein modification um, modulated through a protein kinase, which adds phosphate to a site, specific site in a protein, and then reversed by a protein phosphatase that takes that um, phosphate off. And this process is used to regulate most, if not all, uh, intracellular uh, systems. The history of phosphorylation starts just over a, a hundred years ago with the work of uh, Phoebus Levine working at the uh, Rockefeller Institute who reported in uh, 1906 in the second volume of JBC of the existence uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing about uh, online journals they go all the way back um, the existence of uh, phosphate uh, linked to uh, vitellin an, an egg yolk uh, uh, protein uh, progress after that was a little bit slow. There was some work going on, but it wasn't really until uh, 1932 that uh, the nature of the phosphate linkage in vitellin was definitively ident identified by Fritz Lippmann uh, working with Phoebus Levine as a postdoc. He showed this was predominantly a phosphoserine. At the same time, interestingly, Lippmann synthesized uh, phosphotyrosine his argument being he didn't know what the phosphate linkage in vitellin would be, and so he synthesized all three phosphohydroxy amino acids. That really sat around for another uh, 45 years until tyrosine phosphorylation was discovered. The first protein kinase activity was uh, identified by Eugene Kennedy in, uh, in 1954. This was a casein kinase-like activity. And uh, tyrosine kinases were identified um, in, in 1979. And this has ultimately led to the development uh, of a series of drugs that target uh, protein kinases for use in uh, cancer therapy. Um, my interest in phosphorylation had been peaked then by the discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation. And when the first... Um, cloned protein kinase sequences came out, I began to align these sequences to see if there were some consensuses that were in common. So on the top of this uh, uh, alignment here, you'll see a series of tyrosine kinases that had basically all been identified as oncogene products of uh, acutely transforming retroviruses uh, apart from the uh, insulin receptor. Now on the bottom here are actually three bona fide serine threonine kinases, including the cyclic-AMP-dependent protein kinase, which was, in fact, sequenced the old-fashioned way. That means that the protein was sequenced and not a cDNA. And it became clear from these alignments, and you can see here um, BB stands for before blast. That means they were aligned by I, um, that uh, there were some motifs in common. And there were some differences, actually, uh, particularly in this region between the tyrosine kinases and the serine threonine kinases. So that led to a collaboration with Steve Hanks, uh, sitting here in the second row, to really do this on a larger scale. As more and more kinase sequences became available, um, it was possible to um, align them and show that the catalytic domain spanned around 300 residues. It could be part of a larger protein, and that there were 11 or now 12 uh, motifs in, in what we call subdomains that were the key to um, the similarity between these uh, protein kinases. 
And uh, rather gratifyingly, when the first structure of a protein kinase was reported by Susan Taylor's group in 1991, almost all of these motifs uh, lined the catalytic cleft of this bilobate structure um, where you can see a bound ATP molecule and a pseudo-substrate protein bound here. Uh, for instance, here's the catalytic aspartate acid in position to facilitate phosphate transfer onto an acceptor uh, hydroxy amino acid. So with, um, with um, this ability to use these motifs to define uh, protein kinase catalytic domains and the advent of uh, cDNA cloning and, second, uh, and oligonucleotide, degenerate oligonucleotide screening and then um, ultimately PCR-based uh, cloning, uh, the number of protein kinase catalytic domains began to increase very rapidly. And this is a, a graph of the numbers of protein kinase catalytic genes, mammalian uh, protein kinases um, that I put together in 1987. And I, I would say this is really the birth of the, the kinome. At the time, I predicted there might be as many as a, 1,001 protein kinases in a mammalian genome. And you'll see how close I got in just a minute. So then with the advent of, of whole genome sequencing, it became possible to develop um, hidden Markov models for scanning all of the predicted gene products and um, determine exactly how many protein kinase genes there might be in, in a single organism. And Greg Plowman and I, Greg was then at Sugen, uh, started with uh, budding yeast with its 6,000 or so genes and identified 130 protein kinase genes, around 2% of all genes. The 116 refers to the tightly related eukaryotic protein kinase family and 130 to all protein kinases. Um, most organisms have about 2% uh, of their genes encoding uh, protein kinases, but interestingly, Tyrosine kinases are only found in metazoans. So you can see these two uh, yeasts here have um, no bona fide tyrosine kinases, although they have tyrosine kinase activities like WE1. Um, and where there are tyrosine kinases, such as in C. elegans, then they constitute about 20% of all of the protein kinases in, uh, in the kinome, which is the collection of uh, protein kinase genes. So you can see that um, the human genome had 518 protein kinases, not quite 1,001, but only a factor of uh, two off. And of these, 90 are tyrosine kinases. Interestingly, um, Arabidopsis, the plant, uh, has a significantly higher percentage of kinase genes, largely because of a huge number of receptor-like kinases that appear to be important for uh, the plant to recognize uh, its environment, pathogens, toxic agents, and so on, because it can't run away. Uh, M. brevi coli, a, a, a unicellular coanoflagellate, actually has bona fide tyrosine kinases, and there's an argument from Sean Carroll that this was a precursor to the metazoans. That's where it sort of lies on the evolutionary tree, and potentially one had to have tyrosine kinases in place for the intercellular communication function that tyrosine phosphorylation uh, carries out. So the bottom line is then about 2% of all genes in eukaryotes and co-protein kinases. Uh, Gerald Manning, who did a lot of that analysis and who's now at the Salk Institute, has uh, analyzed um, a number of additional kinomes that I won't really take you through in, in detail. For instance, tetrahymena, um, has a high number of protein kinases, but no tyrosine kinases, it's unicellular. The same is true for dictostelium. And they have a large number of so-called histidine kinases. These are the two component signaling kinases that prokaryotes use. And it sort of looks like there was a flip-flop in which the uh, histidine kinase sensing system, signaling systems were replaced um, by the, uh, the tyrosine kinases. So in sea urchins, for instance, you can see there's already a large number of tyrosine kinases um, but not, no histidine kinases. Um, also, there's another family you'll see on the tree of tyrosine kinase-like kinases that are 
sort of mostly related to the most closely related to the tyrosine kinases. And these also um, seem to emerge earlier than the tyrosine kinases and may have been the progenitors, in fact, to the tyrosine kinase uh, family. Um, if one analyzes different families of um, protein kinases and looks for where protein kinases protein kinase families arose, there are 53 families in common to all eukaryotes. Um, and then as, as the organisms got more complex, you can see the numbers of families generally rose. But interestingly, if you compare vertebrates, and this is among the deuterostomes, vertebrates and sea urchins, you can see there are very few differences actually between a sea urchin and us in terms of families of protein kinases, although there are more protein kinases. So some families have more members in, in vertebrates. And interestingly, um, budding yeast lost a significant number of families. It is, as some people have said, probably a trimmed, slimmed down um, uh, genome and kinome. So if we look at the human protein kinases in a little more detail, uh, out of the 518, 478 are conventional protein kinases in a tree I'm going to show you. They're closely related and 40 are atypical protein kinases like the PI kinase-related kinases that I'm going to talk about one of. Um, and interestingly, about 50 of these conventional protein kinases appear to lack, at least based on the, the absence of key catalytic residues, appear to lack catalytic activity. Uh, and yet many of them have highly, are highly conserved through evolution and presumably do serve an important function, perhaps to regulate other protein kinases through protein-protein interaction. Just uh, for completeness, I'll show you that there are a large number of protein phosphatase, catalytic domain genes, to antagonize the protein kinases. There are about 140 or so, and this number is still growing because there are some new families of protein phosphatases that are appearing, including this haloacid dehalogenase family of uh, protein phosphatases. And these, uh, particularly the serine threonine phosphatases, often have regulatory subunits, which increases the number of different types of protein kinase, uh, protein phosphatase that um, exist in cells. So probably at least 2.5% of all genes are directly de devoted to phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. And if one adds in all of the regulators, uh, the inhibitors, the scaffolding, and anchoring proteins, it's a fair bet that about 5% of all uh, genes are um, involved in uh, phosphorylation-dependent regulation. So this is what the uh, human kinome tree looks like. This is just the EPK family, and you can see there are several major branches. This is the PKA branch. This is the Calmodulin-dependent kinase branch. This is the um, CDC MAP kinase, uh, GSK3 branch. Um, and here the tyrosine kinase-like kinases. It includes protein kinases like RAF, which you'll hear about uh, later in the talk. And here are the uh, 90 tyrosine kinases appropriately on the top of the tree. Um, obviously, this is a lot prettier than <laughs> this, which was drawn by Mark Potensky at a time when I was going around talking about 1,001 protein kinases. Um, one thing that has emerged from analysis of protein kinases and phosphatases is how important they are in human disease. And... Um, this is a, a compilation uh, put together by Gerard Manning, which indicates that about a third of all human protein kinases are now known to be implicated in human disease through mutation, gain of function or loss of function mutations, or amplification, or overexpression. And a, a majority of the, these are, have been implicated in, uh, in cancer. And that's obviously led to a lot of effort in the pharmaceutical industry to develop uh, drugs that inhibit uh, the action of uh, protein kinases that drive uh, cancer. And um, as you heard, one of the success stories in the field actually is the development of Gleevec, uh, an inhibitor of the, uh, the BCR able uh, protein kinase that is generated through a chromosomal fusion that drives uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And I just put this up again for historical purposes, showing how many different threads of research came together that led to the um, development of this drug uh, 
starting with a recognition of CML as a disease in 1845 by uh, two different groups. Um, you can see uh, a number of threads started with oncogenic retroviruses, the Abelson virus that give rise to the Abel, discovery of C-Abel and BCR-Abel, the Rasakoma virus, which gave rise to VSARC and its tyrosine kinase activity, polyoma virus, and um, also the W mutant mouse. So with that rather lengthy introduction, let me turn to the first of my short stories, which is, um, deals with how cells respond to uh, DNA damage, particularly double-stranded breaks, through the activation of a protein kinase, in this case ATM, which is an atypical protein kinase in the um, PI kinase-like kinase family that I'll show you in just a second. So double-stranded breaks can occur naturally during replication, during VDJ recombination, or during um, therapy, radiation or radiomimetic chemical therapy. And we know that defects in the DNA damage response and repair underlie, uh, in many cases, genomic instability in cancer, which enables them to mutate and uh, progress. So a major response to a double-stranded DNA break is mediated by this protein kinase, ATM, which um, is activated when a double-stranded break is recognized by this ternary complex of proteins, MRE11, RAD50, and NBS1, called MRN. ATM, once activated, phosphorylates a series of target proteins, such as P53, that are involved in a series of cellular responses, including uh, cell cycle arrest, DNA repair, transcriptional activation, and if necessary, if the, if it's, uh, the repair is, uh, is not possible, um, uh, in cell death and apoptosis. And we know, actually, that loss of function mutations in ATM, in, in MRE11, and MBS1 in humans leads to an increase in cancer incidence, presumably because double-strand breaks cannot be repaired. You get chromosome fusions and, um, uh, and mutations that drive cancer. Just to give you some sense, though, for how complex this is, um, here is a, a, a summary of a schematic of the proteins that are phosphorylated um, by ATM when the G1S checkpoint is activated. That means DNA damage during the G1 uh, phase of the cell cycle. And you can see a very large number of proteins are known to be phosphorylated by ATM. Uh, these include MBS1 itself, which I'll talk a bit about, uh, and H2AX, an H2 histone, H2A histone variant that I'll also briefly mention. And recent uh, phosphoproteomic surveys by um, the Elledge group and also by cell signaling indicates that there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of proteins phosphorylated in cells where ATM is activated. So this is a very complex uh, response. So ATM is a, a member of this family of atypical protein kinases, of which there are six. Um, these uh, red ones here are involved in um, DNA damage or nutrient sensing, and S SMG1 is involved probably in RNA damage surveillance. They're all huge proteins, ranging from 3,000 to 4,000 residues in length. They have typically an architecture with a, a kinase domain at the C-terminus in a small conserved C-terminal region, and then a large N-terminal extension with a series of heat repeats, which are helical hairpins. As you can see here, the names derived from these proteins that have heat repeats. And the proposal is then that this is, uh, acts as a, um, a landing pad for a whole variety of proteins, which may include substrates and regulators and uh, localization proteins. These are highly conserved proteins. There is an ATM homolog in the yeasts and an ATR homolog in the yeasts. An ATR uh, responds to DNA damage during... Um, S phase, replication stress, for instance. So here's ATM itself. There are 49 heat repeats, and this is the structure of what a heat repeat array might look like that I'll, I'll come back to again in a minute. And importantly, there's an, 
an autophosphorylation site series in 1981 that a lot of us use to monitor ATM activation, although recent data from uh, Michel, uh, no, Andre Nischenzweig's lab suggests that um, this is not as essential for ATM activation. A little bit of background on the MRN complex. Uh, both MRE11 and RAD50 have enzymatic activities. RAD50 is a AAA ATPase. Um, undergoes conformational changes as it hydrolyzes ATP. MRE11 has a whole series of uh, activities that, um, including a nuclease activity and probably some unwinding activity that can um, act on uh, double-stranded DNA, particularly double-stranded DNA with um, uh, of various end uh, characters. So Mike Caston has proposed a model for ATM activation in which um, ATM exists in the form of an inactive dimer in cells and following um, the generation of double-stranded breaks, there is autophosphorylation leading to um, dissociation into active monomers and substrate uh, phosphorylation. And while the series 1981 is probably no longer thought to be important, I think this model still holds in terms of... Uh, dimer to monomer involved in activation. When we started this project, we were actually interested in whether um, this MRN complex was both upstream and downstream of um, ATM activation. It was, a, it was a debate at the time, and now several groups, including ours, have shown that this is in fact uh, the case, that it's both upstream and downstream, and uh, that includes... Um, Yossi Shiloh's group and uh, Matt Weitzman's group, for instance, uh, and Tanya Paul's group. So MBS1 is one of the substrates that I pointed out. So it becomes phosphorylated by activated ATM, and this is required for phosphorylation of some of the downstream targets by ATM, like uh, CHECK2 and P53. So we've studied activation of ATM using an in vitro system derived from Xenopus eggs. Um, this is the work of Zhang Sheng Yu in the lab. And basically, you can make a crude uh, extract from these eggs and use this as a sort of a biochemical cell in the test tube. And this extract will do many things. It will assemble nuclei. It will replicate DNA. And it turns out it will also respond to DNA damage in the sense that if you add a linear DNA molecule to the extract, you see very rapid activation of ATM as marked by this phosphorylation event here. You also see phosphorylation of MBS1. Uh, if you add a circular DNA um, uh, or you don't use an active restriction enzyme to cleave this, you see no activation of, um, of ATM. So we actually had used this and published that uh, MBS1 is required for ATM activation. So in this system, you can use antibody depletion, immunodepletion, to remove um, proteins and... Um, if you remove MBS1 from the extract and now add linear DNA, you, f you do not see uh, ATM activation. Interestingly, if you add back just a C-terminal fragment of um, MBS1, which contains the MRE11 binding site, now you restore ATM activation pretty much. So that's just, this is the region that's critical then for ATM activation. And um, we were able to show that this region, in fact, even this a smaller C-terminal 50 amino acid region, was uh, capable of binding ATM. Uh, as you can see in this pull-down assay here, ATM is bound by this fragment, but whereas MRE11 is not, MRE11 and ATM are bound by this longer fragment here. So... Um, Together with uh, Paul Russell's lab, Charlie Chuan, we were able to identify two short motifs in this C-terminal 50 residues that are key to ATM binding. It's included this um, acidic motif here and this FXY motif here. And uh, mutation of either of them really almost completely abolishes uh, GST C50 binding to, um, to ATM. And it turns out this, these two motifs are conserved in MBS1 throughout the eukaryotic kingdom 
uh, all the way from the yeast to vertebrates. Although it looks as like the order of the MRE11 binding and the ATM binding motifs may be, inter may be somewhat variable or changeable. So together with uh, Charlie Chawan, we were able to show that um, S-POMBI, MBS1, interacts with heat repeats in the middle of this array here in TEL1, which is the POMBI homologue of ATM. And uh, I show you this structure again, which is the structure of the important beta heat repeat domain bound to the FS. FG, a nucleoporin-derived peptide, and you can see it binds on, binds on the outside of this uh, heat-repeat solenoid. And as you remember, one of the two sub-motifs for ATM binding has an FXF or FXY motif in it. And so we think that's how this interaction is occurring um, between MBS1 and ATM. So the idea is then that MRN recognizes somehow the end of a double-stranded DNA molecule, probably not at the very end, but somewhere internally, um, and that this recruits um, ATM, perhaps an ATM dimer, through NBS1 binding to the heat repeats. And then something magical happens that leads to activation and autophosphorylation of ATM. And this probably involves RAD50 and ATP hydrolysis. And what Tanya Paul has shown is that RAD50 and MRE11 are a catalytic activity are required for ATM activation in an in vitro, a biochemically reconstituted uh, system. So that's, that will be a model for how ATM is activated. But one or two double-stranded DNA breaks in the cell are sufficient to activate almost all of the ATM, hundreds of thousands of molecules of ATM in the cell. So there has to be some enormous amplification of this signal. And activating ATM molecules one at a time at the double-stranded break wouldn't seem to get the job done. So Zhang Sheng went on to, to, to investigate this, and what he noted was that um, the length of the double-stranded DNA is very important for maximal activation. So if you add an equal number of DNA ends per mil, and it sounds like a lot of ends, right, nearly a, a billion ends per microliter, that turns out to be five breaks per mammalian cell nucleus equivalent. Um, but you need something around 2 kb to uh, get efficient activation of ATM. So that suggested that probably not only the ends, but the flanking DNA were, was going to be important. And um, the minimum length is 200 base pairs. And that might suggest, and we're still trying to figure this out, that the formation of a nucleosome is required for this activation event. Nucleosomes do assemble in this system. In fact, Ron Lasky used this many years ago to uh, assay for, nuclear, uh, for nucleosome assembly factors. So that's a possibility. So what we think maybe is that um, the nucleosome might be the minimal unit for activation of ATM and one might bind an ATM dimer and activate it on a, on a single nucleosome, but that more likely there's going to be some sort of cooperative activation of ATM bound along a length of, um, of DNA, flanking the DNA end. And so that there's activation at the ends, but there's also going to be activation. Maybe it's loaded on from this end and stays there. There's going to be cooperative activation, which is going to be determined by the length of, of DNA. So we've begun to test some of these models. Um, we've carried out chromatin immunoprecipitation analysis to show that, um, uh, and tested various proteins for where they're bound on a 7KB DNA fragment. And um, so you can see we've tested binding to these three regions here. Q70 is an end binding complex, and you can see it's predominantly bound at the end of the DNA, as we would have predicted. Um, but you can see that particularly phospho-ATM is bound even in the center of this DNA fragment. Uh, there's also some MBS1 there, um, whereas the unphosphorylated ATM seems to be more at towards the end. We've also tried to test whether blocking the sequences flanking the ends of a DNA um, 
with a, uh, a protein would preclude ATM activation. So what we've done here is to take a plasmid with two 24-fold repeats of the LAC operator sequence to which LAC I, the repressor, binds extremely tightly. So we can cut this circle in two different ways to generate a molecule with um, the LAC O repeats at either end or the LAC O repeats in the middle. And we can then add these naked DNA fragments or the same fragments to which we have bound LAC I prior to the, adding to the extract. And you can see that the naked DNAs both activate ATM equally well. However, if you add pre-bind LAC I, now um, the molecule with the bound LAC I at either end on the flanking sequences activates ATM much less efficiently than the molecule which has longer open flanking sequences. So that's consistent with the idea you need to bind ATM to um, the ends uh, to the flanking sequences. We can also sterically hinder the ends of DNA uh, by making biotinylated double-stranded DNAs and binding um, avidin to the end, monomeric avidin to the ends. And um, this, having bound strept avidin at the end, doesn't really affect uh, ATM activation, as you can see here, um, regardless of whether one or both ends is biotinylated. Clearly, the avidin binding inhibits Ku uh, association with the ends, as we would have predicted, but it does not affect uh, ATM uh, binding uh, to this flanking region here. So somehow ATM is being loaded on uh, in a way that's not totally dependent on ends. And finally, and I'm afraid you won't be able to see this, uh, if we take sperm chromatin, damage it with neocarcinostatin, which creates double-stranded breaks, and add it to the extract, we can now see uh, ATM by immunofluorescence bound over long stretches, probably tens to hundreds of kilobases away from the ends of DNA. And so... Um, our model is that uh, the end is critical for initiating this process um, and for recruiting MRN and the first molecules of uh, ATM, but then subsequently there is additional binding of ATM to the flanking sequences. And one possible model is that this requires phosphorylation of H2AX, which creates a binding site for the MDC1 protein via its BRCT repeats. And this um, is known to bind to ATM. And so this could recruit ATM for this, then what we think is a cooperative uh, phosphorylation, transphosphorylation event that then amplifies the signal uh, at a single DNA uh, break. So that's one story. The second story um, concerns a, uh, a fission yeast project that I had to tell for Kathy's sake. Um, and concerns an interplay between two uh, other post-translational modifications between ubiquitination and sumoylation. So you all know about ubiquitination. It's um, a system of tagging proteins with a ubiquitin molecule, which is 76 amino acids long, through an isopeptide bond to a lysine. And if that's then further ubiquitinated to give a polyubiquitin chain, that leads to protein degradation via the proteasome. Uh, ubiquitin can also be a monoadduct, in which case it can be used for uh, protein trafficking, like receptor internalization, and also for transcriptional activation. Um, SUMO is an, uh, uh, the name sounds a s small ubiquitin-like modifier. It's uh, related to ubiquitin, and it's added in very much the same way with a three-enzyme cascade to lysine residues. But it has different functions. It can play roles in transcriptional regulation, subcellular localization of proteins, and it clearly plays an important role in genomic integrity and chromosome uh, function. Um, one level of crosstalk is that sumolation can occur on the same residues as uh, ubiquitination and thereby preclude or block ubiquitination or ubiquitin binding domain binding. But what I'm going to argue is that sumolation may also be a target uh, may also target a protein for polyubiquitination and degradation, so a sumo-dependent ubiquitination. So this story started with a postdoc in the lab, um, Joel Levison, who was working on uh, ARC-1, which is the 
fission yeast ortholog of the aurora A and B cell cycle kinases that are critical for um, entry into mitosis and for um, uh, cytokinesis and chromosome uh, segregation. And he turned it's an essential gene in, um, in S. Pombe. And to try and understand more about it, he carried out a two-hybrid screen. He identified uh, several times the INSEMP homolog in S. Pombe. An INSEMP is part of a chromosome passenger complex that contains a surviving INSEMP, an Aurora B, that's critical for um, chromosome segregation. And also, several times, a small ring finger protein around 250 residues in length that had an obvious ring consensus. Ring domains uh, bind zinc, and there are two zinc ions bound in a, in a ring domain. And many ring domains are known to be E3 ubiquitin ligases. They bind to the E2 conjugating enzyme and promote uh, substrate ubiquitination. Um, what we also noticed was that there was another, or subsequently noticed, there was another related, I wouldn't say closely, but it is clearly related uh, gene in um, S. Pombe, and we've called these rather, uh, in a rather uninspired fashion, ring finger protein 1 and ring finger protein 2. Um, we didn't know what they did, uh, so Joel carried out another two hybrid screen and came up with a series of, of uh, interacting proteins that clearly suggested that somehow RFP1 was involved in sumo elation. So um, he found sumo itself. The Pombe sumo ortholog is called PMT3. He found RAD60, which has three sumo-like domains. He found a sumo E3 uh, ligase. Um, as well as RFP1 itself, suggesting it might homodimerize. So um, he mapped the sumo interacting domain, we call SIM here, in um, RFP1 by carrying out a two hybrid screen. And basically, that uh, defined residues 10 through 41 as being sufficient for binding SUMO in uh, RFP1. So a little motif right at the uh, N-terminus here. And um, it turns out that this contains what had been identified as a, uh, a SUMO interacting um, motif by Minty et al., uh, which has this, this consensus here. And in fact... Um, RFP1 can bind uh, sumo-related proteins from uh, lysates of uh, fish and yeast expressing a, an HA-tagged um, form of PMT3, the sumo homologue. As you can see here, GST RFP1 pulls down uh, uh, sumo, um, here, particularly the LU8 here, uh, pulls down SUMO is detected by anti-HA uh, immunoblotting, whereas GST uh, does not. Um, here you can see the SUMO interacting motifs in the orthologs of this RFP protein, of these RFP proteins, which it turns out are conserved in all um, eukaryotes. So this RNF4 is a mammalian homologue or orthologue of RFP1 and RFP2, and this is HEX3, is the budding yeast orthologue. And um, they all show an alignment actually in two regions within this first 40 residues. Each of these appears to be a sumo interacting motif, so there appears to be a tandem sim motif in this family of proteins. And more recent structural studies from Chen's lab of sumo bound to a sumo interacting motif has suggested actually it's these hydrophobic residues here at the beginning are the most important interaction uh, residues in, in this um, system. So it can be either uh, valine isoleucine space, valine isoleucine, valine isoleucine, or the other way around here. 
And you can see the hydrophobics um, here in the middle, VI, DL, II, DL. So this may be important uh, in a minute. And so all of this family then have both an N-terminal SIM, uh, a C-terminal ring, and actually this interestingly conserved hydrophobic motif at the C-terminus with three hydrophobic residues in it. So we still had no idea what these proteins did, however, and uh, the knockout of RFP1 has no obvious phenotype, and so we had to make the double knockout knowing there are two related proteins, and now you can see um, that the, uh, the double knockout cells do not uh, grow in this uh, sporulation assay here where you can see two viable uh, spores and two spores that uh, either don't grow or give you microscopic um, colonies in the tetrad dissection. So that suggested then that RFP1 and RFP2 are partly redundant and uh, these cells are compromised for viability. They, they grow out extremely slowly. Um, and the obvious characteristic of these cells is that they display loss of genomic integrity. They show... Um, cut uh, nuclei, uh, asymmetric positioning of nuclei, cut, uh, cut nuclei, fragmented chromosomes, and asymmetric positioning of nuclei, consistent then with a role for these, this pair of proteins in uh, maintaining genomic integrity. Now, work on the budding yeast um, ortholog, the HEX3, also known as SLX5, had also suggested a role for these proteins in um, in uh, DNA repair and genomic integrity. Uh, for instance, uh, HEX3 mutations are synthetic lethal with SGS1, DNA helicase, top three topoisomerase uh, mutations. Um, work in yeast also showed that um, HEX3 SLX5 is associated with SLX8, another ring finger protein, both uh, genetically and um, biochemically. And um, that HEX3 SLX5 may be associated with simulated proteins, according to work from Mark Hochstrasser's lab. Um, so again, this is reinforcing the idea that these proteins play a role somehow in simulation-dependent processes involved in uh, DNA repair and genomic integrity. The human homologue has also been worked on. This shows um, ubiquitin ligase activity that's dependent on its ring finger, and association with PML nuclear bodies, which contain a lot of sumo-related proteins, um, which is promoted by sumo, although no direct evidence that this binds uh, sumo. So we carried out some further genetic analysis and showed that um, the double knockout cells, which grow so poorly, can be rescued by re-expression of plasmids expressing either RFP1, RFP2, or the mammalian RNF4. And you can see here growth on um, YES medium. And they also um, rescue uh, sensitivity. They render themselves more resistant to 10 millimolar hydroxyurea, which is a replication stress. So we could use this to test which domains are important for this rescue. And we could show that this requires both the SIM uh, motif and the ring domain based on using mutations that lack the SIM or um, are mutated in one of the cysteines that bind zinc in the ring finger. And the same is, interesting, we found that the mammalian uh, orthologue, RNF4, could also rescue the double knockout phenotypes. And this, too, required the SIM, the ring finger. In this case, we could also show that hydrophobic uh, C-terminus for rescue of, uh, of of growth, particularly in this case on uh, HU. Together with Nick Body at Scripps, we identified the SLX8 ortholog in fish and yeast. And this too, when deleted, shows genomic instability and, and slow growth. And SLX8 deletion can be rescued by expression of RNF4 um, this requires the ring and the C-terminus, but not the SIM domain. I'll try and explain that in just a second. 
So RNA4 has uh, ubiquitin ligase activity, as already shown. Turns out that SLX8 has E3 ligase activity using these in vitro assays where we're looking at this ladder of ubiquitin products. Um, and this uh, is dependent on the RNA4 uh, uh, ring finger, and um, SLX8 has an equally potent uh, E3 ligase activity, but neither of the two RFPs or their ring fingers has uh, E3 ligase activity in vitro, nor do they have sumo E3 ligase activity, which is um, a property of uh, some variant ring finger uh, proteins. So that then suggested to us perhaps um, RFP1 and 2 in combination with SLX8, and we know they interact physically, might act as a sumo-dependent ubiquitin ligase so that the sumo-binding domain of um, RFP1 or 2 would interact with um, a sumo-related protein and the ring finger of, uh, RNA, uh, of uh, SLX8 would be the E3 ligase. But we actually started this with um, RNF4 because we thought that this protein might have everything combined into one. And we didn't know what a substrate would be, so we generated an artificial substrate. Um, we fused SUMO1 or SUMO2 to GST either way around. And then we set up an in vitro ubiquitination assay with ubiquitin E1 and UBC4. Um, and uh, flag-tagged forms of these proteins, which also we had mutated in some cases um, the sumo element at sites that are known to be important for binding the sim based on Chen's structure. And so what you can see, particularly I think perhaps just look at this GST sumo 2 panel here, that... Um, the GST SUMO2 is ubiquitinated um, with wild type RNF4, but not with a delta SIM mutant here. And um, one can see similar results, uh, although perhaps less striking with uh, GST SUMO1 here. Now, this ubiquitination is lost when you delete the SIM from RNF4 or when you mutate SUMO so it can't bind the SIM. So this suggests that ubiquitination is ubiquitin dependent. In the case of the POMBI proteins, we have to use a combination of SLX8 and RFP1 or RFP2, and we see a similar um, uh, SIM-dependent, sumo-interaction-dependent uh, ubiquitination of, in this case, a PMT3 GST fusion protein that's lost when we mutate the PMT3 hydrophobic residues. So you can see the ubiquitinated bands coming up here only when we have SLX8 and RFP1 or 2 in combination. So what that suggests then is, uh, oh, there's one more thing before I conclude then this section. That suggests that uh, this could be a, a sumo-dependent ligase, uh, E3 ubiquitin ligase, and that this might then lead to polyubiquitination of these proteins and their degradation. Consistent with that, we see accumulation of sumo-related proteins in uh, the double knockout uh, cells here. You can see using anti-PMT3 immunoblotting, significantly more uh, sumo-related proteins in these cells, total cell extract. We don't know what they are, but they accumulate, and that's true also for SLX8 uh, knockout strains. So then our model would be that a subset of sumo-related proteins, we don't know how they're going to be selected, are targets for this E3 ligase in which the SIM interacts with the SUMO and through uh, the associated ring finger, which in the case of the fission yeast and budding yeast proteins is uh, a heterodimeric partner. This leads to the ubiquitination of um, the protein that's SUMO-related. Well, in the case of RNF4, this is um, simply... Um, all done through a single protein here. Now, in the case of the, of the yeast proteins, this is a, a ring, potentially a ring-ring heterodimer, and we know of other E3 ligases where there are 
two ring fingers where one is active as an E3 ligase and the other is not, such as BARD1 and BRCA1. So to conclude this then, um, the RFP1 and 2 are nuclear proteins with redundant functions. Uh, they appear to be essential for genomic stability in fish and yeast. Um, their combined function requires a functional sumo-interact, sumo-interacting motif and uh, a ring domain. They themselves lack intrinsic ubiquitin or sumo ligase activity, but together with SLX8, they appear to be able to ubiquitinate um, sumo-related proteins in a sumo-dependent fashion. So far, we've only seen mono and oligo-ubiquitination, and maybe we don't have the conditions right, or maybe this is, in fact, the answer, and an E4 adds additional ubiquitin chains. This function appears to be conserved in all eukaryotes. RNF4 is a physical and functional fusion of RFP12 and SLX8. Um, and this then adds um, a new um, type of post-translational modification-dependent ubiquitination system to add to phosphorylation and glycosylation-dependent uh, E3 ligases. Now, obviously, the key is what are the targets for this system, and really, we don't have a lot of clues. We're just beginning to now look for this. We have some hints from the genetic interactions seen in budding yeast. Um, there are obviously ways of trying to pull down target proteins using the SIM is what we're trying. The fact that it's a, a tandem SIM suggests that actually its targets may be um, proteins that are either di sumo or have branch sumo chains, and that's something uh, we're currently looking at. I'll tell you one very short last story. I know I'm going to be a bit late, but we started just a little late, and that's um, a cancer story which relates to uh, when cells become motile during uh, mammary uh, carcinogenesis. And uh, we know that very early lesions um, in cancer, so-called uh, ductal carcinoma in, in situ, are clearly the earliest stage that can be detected and are more frequently being diagnosed in breast cancers. And it's not these uh, lesions which kill, but it's the metastases. And so we'd really like to understand how cells escape from this type of uh, encapsulated structure and become uh, metastatic. And so we have actually been using um, the MCF10A system that Joan Brugge popularized to try and gain some understanding of uh, cell motility uh, in these very early uh, breast carcinoma lesions and then try and use this information to understand how motility might lead to uh, progression. So in this system, as um, Joan Brugge and Mina Bissell have very nicely demonstrated, single uh, MCF10A, the normal, semi-normal human mammary epithelial cells, uh, grow on a solid layer of matrigel in a 2% matrigel overlay as uh, uh, single cells that then divide. These cells divide a number of times to form a sphere of cells and then the central cells are lost by apoptosis and autophagy to yield um, hollow uh, acini that resemble ductal structures in the mammary gland. And I think I'll skip that. What um, Joan has, largely Joan Brugge's group has shown is that one can perturb this process by expression of a series of different oncogenic proteins. Um, one can rescue the apoptosis of the central cells by simply expressing an anti-apoptotic protein like BCL2. One can drive hyperproliferation without uh, blocking apoptosis with uh, genes like HPV, E7, or cyclin D. And one can uh, get hyperproliferative ACNI with cells surviving by combining these two if one expresses oncogenic kinases, particularly IGF-1 receptor or B2, one now sees uh, a loss of architecture and uh, hyperproliferation and resistance to apoptosis. So Gray Pearson, a postdoc in the lab, has been interested in the role of activation of ERK-MAP kinase in these structures. It's commonly activated in breast carcinomas. 
He has used an inducible form of RAF1 uh, developed by Martin McMahon, in which the catalytic domain of RAF1, which activates MEK and then ERK-MAP kinase, is fused to the ligand binding domain of the estrogen receptor, a mutated version, so it can be activated by 4-hydroxy tamoxifen, which leads to dissociation of HSP90 and activation of this mutant catalytic domain. And he has introduced this now into MCF10A cells, which are then also marked by uh, expression of H2B GFP to label the nuclei of these cells so we can follow these cells in real time using a spinning disc confocal and 4-hydroxytamoxifen to activate RAF in these cells. And this just shows you, this is a cycling loop now, uh, of uh, GFP RAF ER, where the cells, uh, the, 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 when it's at the lowest intensity, it's before the activation with 4-hydroxytamoxifen, and then as the protein becomes activated, it accumulates and the GFP signal brightens, and at the same time, you can see activation of ERK as monitored by phosphoerk staining in almost all of the cells in the, in the ACNI. Um, so what about motility? Well, if you look at a control acinus, you can see uh, this is imaged uh, 20 hours after addition of diluent um, for 20 hours at 30 minute, 30 minute intervals. And you can see, if I can start the movie again, cells really don't, uh, no, nope, it's not going to start again. The cells really don't move. You'll see it again. If you look now at cells in which RAF has been activated, you see these dramatic cell movements in most of the RAF ER ACNI. And um, we've now highlighted some cells, and you can see that they, how, how much they move around. They change partners. They move in different directions. They move into the lumen and out again. They re-interdigitate between uh, cells in the outer layer. And if you track these cells, you can see how much they've moved compared to cells in the control here. Um, it's quite dramatic difference here, increase in motility. Um, it's just another example. This gives you some more features of these cells. And uh, the speeds are quite uh, significant here, up to 360 nanometers uh, per minute. But interesting, they do not invade out of the basement membrane that surrounds these ACNI. They are stuck in there. They seem to bounce off it. Um, and that just shows you the tracks of that set of cells. In contrast, if you express HPDE7 in these cells, you see that there really isn't much motility. You can see interesting things like this cell divides into the lumen. Um, you can see the chromosome segregating here. You can see a cell undergoing apoptosis as it moves into the lumen. Um, but these cells really don't move. In contrast, again, if you express the IGF-1 receptor in these cells, um, there's a lot of, it's amorphous obviously, but there's a lot of movement of these cells. Um, and we think this is all in part driven, at least by um, MAP kinase activation. So what pathway might lead to motility? Well, it's presumably it's actin-based. Um, we know of a pathway through ERK2 that leads to phosphorylation of myosin light chain kinase, uh, which activates it, which leads to phosphorylation of myosin light chain 2, which activates the myosin uh, ATPase and leads to uh, uh, contraction. So does this happen in these cells? Yes, you can see uh, myosin light chain 2 phosphorylation in cells with activated RAF ER. You do not see an HPV E7 ACE and I. Um, so is, is the motion dependent on myosin motors? We've used blebistatin, which is an inhibitor of the myosin 2 um, ATPase. And there's a control acinus uh, with activated RAF ER. And here's one which was treated with blebistatin. You can see it's barely moving here. So yes, it apparently requires myosin. Um, I think I'll skip this for the sake of time. Are, is myosin light chain kinase required downstream of um, ERK? Well, we've checked this with a myosin light chain kinase inhibitor, uh, ML7. And we actually also used 
another inhibitor of this signaling pathway, uh, potential activator of the signaling pathway, ROC1 and 2 kinases, which act through the myosin light chain phosphatase so that uh, ROC1 and 2 phosphorylation um, leads to myosin light chain phosphatase inactivation and myosin light chain 2 phosphorylation. And um, we've actually had to use a combination of these two inhibitors to block myosin light chain phosphorylation. So you can see here, uh, here's myosin light chain 2 phosphorylation. With these two inhibitors, we lose um, uh, phosphorylation of myosin light chain 2. And um, here you can see that this significantly inhibits the motility of, uh, of these cells. So, um, I'm going to skip that. We also know this process is dependent on PI3 kinase, but it's a story that I'll have to wait for another time. And to conclude then, potentially an acquisition of cell motility in these structures is an early event in mammary tumor genesis dependent on events that might lead to activation of ERK or perhaps PI3 kinase activity. But acquisition of this motility is not synonymous with um, invasive growth because the cells stay within the uh, ASINA structure and presumably additional mutations, perhaps expression of proteases, is needed for in an invasive motility. Uh, this non-invasive motility, as we've called it, requires increased signaling to the actin motility system. Um, and we think then that alterations to mutations in the tumor genome that are selected for um, during early events of tumor genesis may ultimately be important for subsequent in invasive growth. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and thank the people who have uh, done the work. The work on the kinome analysis was largely the work of Gerard Manning at the Salk. Uh, the work on ATM was largely the work of Zhongsheng Yu. The work on ubiquitin and sumo was carried out by Hua Yu San, whose name I forgot to mention, uh, a project cited by Joel Levison. And the work on RAF, ER, uh, and cell motility was carried out by Gray Pearson in the lab. Thanks very much. <laughs>